Um, yes, and hopefully this is also uh, recording. I don't need to be here, do I? I can move about. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, wrong bunch of slides. You are certainly in camera. I can see you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So I would, I, we have to have this slide up uh, for a little bit, um, which I hope is going to be showing. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, I know you wanted this one. Yeah, yeah, so. but, but it's not recording for some reason, but it doesn't matter. I think the, the message that we wanted to pass. I can record it on us at mhrc at winchester.ac.uk to get information about how to access our expertise. So we, we have to do this because of our sponsors. So please bear in mind that. Thank you. Right. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, and, and thank you um, for having me here, um, to Graciela and Chris. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and for those of uh, you joining online, thank you as well. Um, I will talk about um, Belarusian history, but um, if anybody at the end of the talk has questions about contemporary affairs, I'm also very happy to talk about the contemporary situation uh, as far as I as far as I can. Um, so this um, talk on Pyotr Masharov and late Soviet Belarus um, is part of the book project, as, as Chris has mentioned. Um, uh, I started it as a biography of a, of a man, a political biography of, of one person, but it sort of exploded or in, expanded into a biography of, of what is now an independent country, what was then um, a Soviet Republic, um, Belarus. Uh, why did I pick Mascherov? Um, well, uh, he was the first secretary of the Belarusian Communist Party between 1965 and 1980. Um, every republic, um, ethnic republic in the Soviet Union had their own Communist Party, which of course was subservient, completely subordinate to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, but nevertheless, there was that sort of symbolic, and in many cases it was more than just a symbolic um, institution. And Masharov being the first secretary, uh, in, in plain speak, that meant he was one of the most powerful people in, in Belarus, if not the most powerful politically persons in Belarus. Um, but he's also a very interesting individual. Um, one thing that sort of made me think about him is how enormously popular he had been in, um, in Belarus for decades after his death in 1980. He remained one of the most highly regarded public figures in Belarus. Um, the image of him in the uh, Belarusian press after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, so we're talking about from 1990s onwards, has been overwhelmingly positive, uh, approaching the status of a cult figure, almost a legendary um, figure. Um, lots of memoirs about him have been published or memoirs that mention him, uh, working with him, encountering him and so on. And they all sort of agree um, universally. Um, it's getting very boring, actually, on how nice he was, how decent, how honest, how uncorrupt, how intelligent and so on. Um, but also I have something a little bit more tangible than that. Um, uh, there was an institute in Belarus for a long time until relatively recently when it was uh, when it found itself impossible to exist and was pushed out of Belarus by, by the authorities. But the institute was called the Independent Institute for Socioeconomic and Political Research. Um, their job uh, was to conduct various opinion polls on all kinds of political, economic, social matters. And one of their questions, which they asked regularly um, from the audience, um, from the national audience uh, between 1996 and 2013, not annually, but at kind of regular intervals, was name the most you know respected um, political figure or public figure in your opinion. Who um, and people were not limited to just Belarus or to contemporary affairs; they could pick out of a whole variety of people from Margaret Thatcher, um, who was quite popular, well regarded in the former Soviet Union to um to historic figures from Belarusian um you know historical pantheon to uh, contemporary figures like Belarus president Lukashenko uh a former president uh or uh Putin and in all of these polls except two 
Um, so, so in all of these polls, uh, Marcello came up as number one or number two, leading these polls. Uh, or uh, And in all except two, uh, he beat Lukashenko in popularity. So I, you know, I, I began to ask, well, why? What is it about him that is so, um, so attractive to people? And I have a, a, a sort of a anecdotal uh, uh, evidence to support that popularity. One of the um, trips I made to Minsk um, to to look at him in the archives and in libraries. I was returning home um, after a day in the library uh, on the metro, and I had you know kind of papers on my lap um, from my 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 treasure hunt uh, in the, in the library and one of those photocopies uh, uh, copies was uh, had a photograph of Musharraf and a complete stranger sitting next to me in the metro kind of looked over and said is that Musharraf and I said yes it is and this prompted this you know complete stranger on on the metro train to just launch into a, a speech about what a great guy he was and how he was really someone who had Belarus interests at heart um, and how everybody loved him and how, you know, he could talk to people and how when he was killed in a car crash in 1980 and this man sitting next to me heard that news um, uh, on the radio, he burst into tears. So, you know, this was the kind of extent of popular love. And yes, you know, um, looking at this man that I am, talking about. He was undoubtedly charming. He had a lot of charisma. He was a people's man. Um, it's not just strangers on the train, but all sorts of uh, uh, people who worked with him, you know, his party comrades, his aides, his subordinates, his colleagues, even the family cook I interviewed, <laughs> who's 90 something and still very sharp, um, all talk about him in glowing terms um, and, and all think of him uh, very highly still. Um, and, and, and all kinds of ordinary people in, in Belarus as well. They remember him as being very warm, kind, um, modest, um, being down to earth, having a sense of humor, although some said he couldn't tell a joke, but he appreciated them when others told them better. Um, and his ability to put people at ease in conversations. And this charisma, as you can see, I think was helped by attractive appearance. He was recognized as being you know, good looking, uh, tall, he was quite tall, slim, uh, always took great care about his clothing, so he looked very elegant, even in the Soviet circumstances, um, even, you know, stylish, dandy, bit of a dandy. Um, he projected a very dynamic, you know, image, very much in contrast with the Brezhnev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the same time. He had a commanding presence. Um, he did not look out of place next to such you know, literally giants like Fidel Castro, who visited Belarus uh, in the early 70s, and Masharov hosted him as head of state, so here they are climbing the steps to a war memorial near Minsk. Uh, or indeed Richard Nixon, another dignitary that visited Belarus uh, and Minsk and, and did not look out of place next to, to Masharov. Uh, but he was also um, approachable, a people's man. Uh, a man who could just just as easily don, you know, rubber boots uh, and wade through the mud of a farming field and talk to farmers, as he often did. Indeed, he had a helicopter that he used to land virtually in the middle of a field, unexpected, and, you know, inspect the collective farm or, or talk to people and kind of gauge their opinions. Um, so decades after his death, people... Um, uh, from his district or that he was born in, recalled his warmth, his uh, the fact that he shook their hands with both of his hands, you know, as a mark of respect, um, that he was a very easy to talk to. He hugged his former pupils. He was very open, very much down to earth and had a big heart. Um, and and uh, by the way, this woman is completely no relation to him, just as much of a stranger as that man on the metro train was to me. Uh, he didn't hug me, thank God. Um, but um, she's here, you know, hugging the first secretary of the Communist Party, telling him about what her concerns and joys of life are. Um, there are a few more images. This is him just walking through the crowds, literally, you know, without very much. He did have bodyguards, but as you can see, they're not very visible here, nor are they um, sort of hugging him um, uh, in terms of protecting him. He mingles quite freely with people. This is a, a victory day celebration 
in central Minsk. Um, and he bumps into former, he was a partisan war hero, so he bumps into former comrades and, and again, you know, hugs him, um, chats to them, finds time to do this. Um, I have a story of um, uh, a group of students who came from Vitebsk University, which was his alma mater, um, and they had a completely spontaneous idea to uh, to do something that Masharov had done when he was a young student um, and have a, a skiing expedition from Vitebsk to Minsk. So they set completely self-organized and ended up in Minsk after, you know, quite a track from Vitebsk, which is in north east of Belarus, um, and uh, met him and, and <laughs> ended up in the a residence, his office, unannounced, without any appointment scheduled, and said, we would like to see Masharov, please. Uh, and rather than being shooed away um he actually said okay we'll let them in and found the time in his busy schedule to have a chat to them to sign some books and i i got these photographs or copies of these photographs from a, a vitebsk university museum where the woman who was part of that student excursion left them and and told the story about this um episode so um you know very much a people's man but much Shero was a lot more than just a popular politician, uh, and this is the main reason why I'm interested in him. Um, his rather extraordinary life story parallels the fate and, and life story of, of Belarus itself. Belarus is a new nation. The forces that shape his career path, his personal path, um, also shaped and defined the path of, of the Belarusian Republic. Both his and, and Belarus' um, fates were impacted powerfully by, by the Russian Revolution of 1917, by Stalinism, um, by the Second World War, um, by Nazi occupation of Belarus, um, by post-war reconstruction, uh, rebuilding, modernization of Belarus, this kind of progress that Belarus made in the post-war era in the political, geopolitical hierarchy of the Soviet structures or, and, and republican st structures. All of that um, uh, can be kind of replicated or, or viewed through the prism of, of Masharov's life. And this makes um, Masharov's life an extraordinary window into which, uh, through which observe the history of modern post-war Belarus especially. Um, this is a, a fairly little studied, little understood um, Soviet Republic, but a very important Soviet Republic on the Western borderlands, um, especially in the post-war period. Um, and its importance is symbolized, uh, among lots of many other things, by the fact that it was only one of, um, it occupied one of three seats on the UN Security Council after the war that were given to one to the Soviet Union as a whole, one to Ukraine and one to Belarus. It was also one of very few Soviet republics to actually hold a nuclear weapons arsenal on its territory. It was trusted enough and considered to be loyal enough um, to have that. It doesn't anymore, you'll be pleased to know, but who knows for how long. But of course, Mascherov was more than a symbol of Belarus or its fate. He was not just a product of its recent history, but also someone who shaped it because he was in the position as the most powerful man in Belarus as a first secretary of the Communist Party. Um, he was in, in, in that position and he was there for a good 15 years. Imagine Macron being there for 15 years. Yeah. Um, so that's a long time. And even though he was, of course, constrained by Soviet political structures, by Moscow's dominance, his, I love this photograph because he is Brezhnev looking on to, <laughs> from behind on my shirt and watch your step. Um, but nevertheless, you know, within the context of the Republic, um, he had a certain degree of autonomy, and that's, and that's another reason why I think it, this is interesting, is to just to gauge how much autonomy the republics actually had in the Brezhnev era. And um, my sense is that uh, a lot more than we used to thinking. So, when Petya Mascherro uh, was born, um, Petya is the, uh, as a, uh, as a sweet little name for Piotr, um, he was born in a middling peasant family in uh, a village in the uh, Mogilov Gubernia. This was then um, uh, Mogilov Gubernia, now it's part of Vitebsk region, um, of the former Russian Empire. He was born 
on 13th of February, uh, 1918. And the country that he would grow up to govern did not yet exist when he was born. But the Russian Revolution has already set in motion the forces that would bring it about. Um, the Russian Empire was gone, then the monarchy was gone. Um, civil war had started. And um, only a month after little Peter was born um, in, in Belarus, in Minsk, the first Belarusian um, National Republic was proclaimed. This was on 25th of March 1918. And this was a proclamation by a group of um, Belarusian nationalist intellectuals who took advantage of the German occupation of, uh, of that region, which was you know, comparatively benign and, and did not support very much, but did not oppose a proclamation of independence um, by these intellectuals. But of course, uh, that soon collapsed and, and this republic only existed really for about a, a few weeks. But it propelled the Soviet, the, the fledging Soviet um, state to um, declare their own Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, um, which was announced on 1st of January in 1919. Um, it, it took a few years for the borders to settle, uh, but Belarus, Soviet Belarus was there to stay, unlike the first um, declaration of national independence. Um, and this map shows um, this relative size. It was very small compared to the um, territory of Belarus today. It's only half the size, but it was even smaller in 1921. So the pink area is really tiny, puny. Um, and this was the result of the Soviet-Polish negotiations after the um, so, uh, Soviet-Polish War um, and the Treaty of Riga, which was concluded in 1921. But even the Soviets thought this is too small. <laughs> we need to make it bigger um, for all kinds of geopolitical reasons, which I can explain if anyone wants to ask that question. Um, but there were further additions to it in 1922, 24, and this is the yellowish, greenish bit, and uh, a little bit more in 1926. So this became the shape of the interwar um, Belarusian Republic. Um, and Peter came from up here. So this bit uh, only became Belarus in 1926 when he was already eight. Um, and his home became part of Belarus. But it seems that his family did speak Belarusian. Um, and it, it's all these kind of um, language, religion, ethnic identity issues here are incredibly complicated and entangled but very interesting. Now the new republic, the new regime brought with it education opportunities and uh, Piotr and his older brother Pavel were the first two um, children from their village to go on to complete a high school education and they were the first ones from their village to go to university. Uh, for Masharov this was the Vitebsk Pedagogical University from which the institute at that time uh, from which he graduated in 1939 to become a teacher of physics and maths. The 1930s were also the time of um, Stalinist terror. And Belarus not only was not an exception to, to that, but it suffered more than some other republics in terms of, um, in terms of arrests um, and executions. Numbers, precise numbers of how many people perished or how many people were affected, were arrested, are very difficult to estimate because Belarusian archives are not still not fully opened um, and they, with regards to the terror, are pretty much closed. So researchers have found it very difficult to, you know, estimate and, and estimates vary enormously. Um, but it is clear that proportionally Belarus suffered worse than uh, a lot of other republics. And Masharov's family were impacted too. Even though their origins were humble, they were peasants. Um, he, his father was arrested unexpectedly in 1939. Well, it's always unexpected, but um, uh, he was just taken away by the NKVD officers and they never heard from him again. Uh, and then later they found out that he died in March 1938. He was not a young man and um, it was clear he wasn't going to make it and he didn't. Uh, now, the Masheros never got an official explanation why he was arrested, uh, but they suspected a denunciation letter played a part. Um, in the archives, I found things that suggest that actually Masharov Sr. 
did not get on with Soviet power. Um, and there were tensions or conflicts, perhaps he was accused of, you know, being a religious activist. But these things have to be taken with a pinch of salt because they might mean all sorts of other things um, in the Soviet context. However, that was he was gone. And it was a huge shock for the family. It was a huge trauma, but it did not affect their life chances, which is quite unusual. Um, they seem to have used a strategy that was simple, but often overlooked by a lot of people. They moved. Um, Masharov was able to graduate from the Institute. His brother graduated from the Institute uh, and they went to their place of you know, job allocation to another um, district school where they taught and they took their family, their sisters, their mother with them. And that was that. And he started his um, teaching career uh, in a place near Vitebsk. I'm not sure I will be able to find it on this map. Um, part of northwest eastern part of Belarus. He taught for two years before all that came to an end. The war started. The war put an end to his teaching career. Uh, and the war, the Second World War, was a defining experience in, in many ways, both for Masherov, but also, as I'll mention in a little while, for Belarus um, as, a, as a republic, as a nation. Um, the war for Masherov brought forth and forged the character, the, the features of his personality that I think made him the kind of leader that he became, the political leader that he later became. Um, his trajectory during the war is quite uh, dramatic. That's good enough for, for a novel. He was, um, he volunteered for the front in the very first days of the war, uh, but before he even got anywhere uh, near the, the you know, where they were meant to go to be trained and armed. Um, they were surrounded by the Germans and he was captured and he became prisoner of war before he even, you know, took part in the war. Um, he was being taken with a lot of other POWs um, uh, out of the country. He assumed on a train and out of a full packed train, you know, cattle carts, shock of luck with people. He was the only one who jumped. I uh, jumped out of a small window, no one else, joined him because they thought it was suicide, but he survived and he effectively walked back um, through Lithuania to um, his home region where he got home to his mother um, and began to, by that point it was occupied territory um, and he was working for the Germans as an accountant in the collective farm and as a teacher. While he was doing that, he was also building an underground resistance network, mainly um, made up with of his own pupils and, um, you know, villages and neighbors. Um, and in spring of 1942, um, when they had enough weapons, enough training, enough supplies, they all took to the woods. He took his entire senior year, just boys, not the girls, with him to the woods. And they became a partisan detachment, not sent from Moscow, not governed or managed by Moscow, but completely so from the ground. And he was elected the commander, they actually voted and he was not appointed again, like a crucial point, but elected a commander. Uh, he showed himself a very capable leader um, who had a lot of personal courage, uh, had a good knack for human psychology. Um, as I'm getting this from memoirs of his comrades in arms. Uh, he could persuade, obviously, people to follow him in extreme danger when they were all very aware of that danger. Um, but he was also easy on people. Um, and that's something you can get a lot um, from memoirs that he wasn't harsh. Um, he, he understood, he kind of had um, some understanding for people's weaknesses and, and so on. He distinguished himself. He was a, clearly showed some, you know, strategic, tactical, military talent, um, distinguished himself well, was wounded twice. And in 1944, um, oh, sorry, I have this uh, image of him, a photograph of him with his comrades, not from 1942, I don't think much later, but that's him. Um, but in 1944, towards the end of the war, he was um, awarded the highest award in the Soviet Union, the hero of the Soviet Union, which was marked with a golden star, which you can see here. His sisters learned about it from the newspaper because they were somewhere in evacuation um, and kept, caught his name in the list of heroes. He was just 26 at this point. Um, 
Masharab's experiences in many ways represent those of the Republic. Um, his contribution to, to the war effort uh, echoes the contribution of Belarus as a whole, uh, which had the largest partisan movement on its territory um, and in Soviet history. Uh, according to some um, scholars, in December 1942, uh, almost 50% of all partisans, pro-Soviet partisans, that is, in, in, in the war were in Belarus. Uh, and after the war, a lot would be made of this contribution by Belarus to the Soviet war effort. So Belarus had a special place um, and, and in kind of public memory of the war and uh, a special identity that was built on the uh, foundation of that war contribution and what was made of it. Um, partly this was because of the partisans like Masher becoming leaders of the Republic in the post-war period. But this, this came at a terrible cost. War and occupation transformed Belarus. Uh, the war raised most of its cities and villages to the ground. Um, it took lives of millions of its residents. Uh, no other European country bore such losses as, as Belarus. If you're interested to know more about that particular episode um, in, in Belarusian history, um, Timothy Snyder's book Bloodlands is, is a good, good source on that. But uh, proportionally to its size, Belarus lost the largest share of people um, in the war, either killed or, or deported. It destroyed almost entirely, the war destroyed almost entirely its large Jewish community. Um, it caused many Poles to flee Belarus um, and generally just completely changed the demographic map of that region. Um, the war brought suffering and Masharov lived again through a personal trauma. Um, he really felt that um, and this was the loss of his mother, uh, who to him he was very close. Um, she was not just his mother, she was also his comrade in arms. She worked for the partisans, but she continued to live in the village. Um, and she was uh, captured by the Germans who suspected her of partisan activity, uh, along with some neighbours and, and you know, family members of people in the sheriff's detachment. They were tortured and killed. Um, uh, shot at the edge of a small lake um, in the early hours. On the 9th of September, there was a witness, um, an old local man who hid in a shed um, and witnessed the execution. And 10 days later, the partisans took over um, this little town of Rassoni, uh, including the sheriff, and they found the bodies. And they were able to identify some of them. And he identified the body of his mother by a dress, polka dot dress that she got before them. He blamed himself for her death and carried that guilt with him for the rest of his life. Um, and there are various testimonies of family members and uh, colleagues who witnessed some elements of that. And, um, and I think it's a safe, safe statement to make that he did. Now, losing his mother and also his partisan comrades, many of whom remember were his former pupils, um, uh, you know, the, the kids that he, he really related to. Um, that, I think, um, impacted him a lot uh, and uh, fostered his capacity for sympathy and humanity, um, which also shaped his attitude to war, which was a little bit in dissonance with the sort of official collective um, public memory of World War II, which made all the emphasis on human deeds, on glory, on resilience, on, on strength, and underplayed, to put it mildly trauma, loss, um, and, and collaboration, and all kinds of difficult issues of the war. Um, despite that kind of booming war cult almost in the British Navarra, Masharov did not like to talk about the war, and he um, made it clear on a number of occasions that he thought idealizing the war, or kind of using it as a, as a way to bring up the young generation was wrong and, you know, morally comprehensible. But of course, you know, publicly he played law. Uh, but the war was also a time of politicization, and um, this is when Masharov joined the party. Um, he, at first as a candidate member in 1942, then as a full member in 1943. And in 1943, he becomes the first secretary of the Vileka Underground Regional Council Committee. 
uh, which is just at the lower kind of ranks of the Komsomol weather local. Um, and this is the beginning of his career, party career. He's nev he never goes back to school. Um, he changes, war changes his path quite dramatically. Uh, the town of which he became the Komsomol secretary uh, was still was Western Belarus. And um, that uh, you know, that had been part of Poland in the interwar period and was uh, part of Belarus now because of the Nazi uh, Soviet non-aggression part. And most of those borders were respected after the war. Belarus kind of kept the territory, um, most of it. <clears throat> and so Masharov is kind of sent to a, a, an area that is still, as it were, under war conditions. There are still those who resist Soviet power and, and um, the war, in a sense, continues there. But he then forges various new links. He becomes part of a very powerful network of partisans in the post-Soviet um, Republic. This network would dominate the Republic's government and politics. Um, he moves up the ranks very quickly because they needed men and he was very capable uh, and he was very clearly very loyal and had all the right credentials, except having the father who had been arrested and uh, spending four days in general activity. Those were serious problems on your biographical sketch if you were in the Soviet Union in the late 1940s. Uh, but it's also the time when Masharov can forge links and, and his partisan experience was the time when he forged links with people who would later become very important in Soviet power structures going all the way to Moscow um, and being part of the Soviet um, political elite. Now, again, all of this typifies the situation with the Republic in general. The occupation and the war leave enormous trauma in Belarus. Hardly a family was left unscathed. But the war also laid foundations for the development of a, a specific kind of identity and um, reputation as a partisan republic that suffered a lot, but also, you know, did a lot, was brave, courageous um, and all that. That identity even predates the Brezhnev era war cult um, or public war memory. Um, not all of war memories are welcome, as I've already mentioned. You know, uh, the fact that not everyone joined partisans, that there was collaboration, um, that is not supposed to be discussed or mentioned. The fact that the partisans did not always have a harmonious relationship with the locals who suffered German reprisals um, for their activities. Um, uh, all because partisans took the last of their food. Um, bats also brushed under the carpet. According to one former comrade, Masharov always um, said sorry to the farmers for taking their food <laughs> um, or negotiated with them, but who knows? Maybe he did. Um, none of that is supposed to be discussed or remembered. The partisans are untouchable, the heroes of the post war period. Um, but as I say, Masharov also needs to keep the memory of his um, captivity, German captivity, or working for the Germans for part of his, you know, war record secret. He doesn't keep it secret, but he doesn't go about talking about it or advertising it. Um, and he has a point. In 1949, a denunciation letter sent about him to Moscow, saying that he was a collaborator, um, that his uh, father was an uh, enemy of the people. Um, and all, all those, you know, dangerous things are going to put in that letter. His partisan comrades rally behind him and they, you know, attest to his impeccable war record, his heroism, self-sacrifice, the fact that his mother was killed by the Germans and so on. And he um, is OK. This does not halt his process, probably progress, sorry, probably, um, you know, was very tense um, a few weeks and months of the investigation. But um, he continues his march forward. So the first post-war decade saw his political career take off. Um, he arises through the ranks of the Komsomol, which is the, the junior league of the Communist Party, uh, and becomes the, um, the leader of Soviet Komsomol in Belarus in October 1947, which so is two years after the war. Um, the second decade after, after the war, so from mid-50s to 60s, see him climb through, uh, climb up the, um, you know, the the political career ladder in the party. So he, having served for about 10 years in the Komsomol, he then promoted to the party itself as a grown up. Um, and he rises very quickly as well. Finally, in 1965, 
he becomes the first secretary of um, the Soviet Belarus, of Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. Sorry, of the of the Communist Party of Belarus. Mm. The immediate post-war decades. So sorry, this is him um, being congratulated by um, Nikita Khrushchev on, on some uh, award that Khrushchev um, brought with him to Minsk. And this is him 19, uh, in the 1970s sometime or, or possibly late 60s, but not later than 77 with Comrade Brezhnev. The same happens with Belarus in these two post-war decades. Um, as I say, the war left a huge trauma, um, destroyed its ethnic diversity. But the post-war years are also a time of opportunity, of growth, of um, economic and um, political development, if you like. For once, Belarus secured its enlarged borders. It's now twice the size of what it was before 1939. Um, it also emerges almost like phoenix from the rubble to which it was reduced by the war um, and becomes the uh, a soviet industrial stronghold um, it was you know a kind of agricultural backwaters in the um, in the russian empire before the the war and it is transformed through investment through an effort on the part of moscow into this um, industrial powerhouse relatively in you know, a soviet industrial powerhouse um, and um, it has also a distinctive political role that it plays in the Soviet Union. Um, its wartime suffering are kind of a, a, a flagship case study of Soviet um, uh, public war memory. They're enshrined in this cult of the Second World War that grows under Brezhnev. Um, the partisan republic is given economic resources for growth, for um, a development and also an international status, like many other republics. Belarus gets its own Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, you know, symbolically it can conduct its own international affairs, of course, completely towing the Moscow line in all sorts of things. But as I say, it gets a separate security seat on the UN Security Council and so on. And Masharov became first secretary in 1965 uh, after the coup against Nikita Khrushchev. Um, not directly as a result, he was not directly involved, but his predecessor, uh, Kirill Mazurov, another partisan hero, another Belarusian, the first Belarusian to stay in that post of the first secretary for any meaningful length of time. Um, he was part of the anti Khrushchev coup, and for his role, once the Brezhnev leadership uh, comes to office, he is promoted and goes to Moscow. So somebody has to fill in his shoes and become the first secretary of the Communist Party in Belarus. Um, Moscow has a different guy in mind, not Masharov, but the local elites, political elites, the regional secretaries, they want him. And he becomes the first secretary. So again, to the question of how much uh, leverage an ethnic republic has with the center, um, this seems to be a case that they, uh, the local interests prevail. Now, under Mascherov's leadership, Belarus thrives, really thrives. Um, during these years, the impressive postal reconstruction is completed, and it was impressive um, given the, the kind of degree of destruction. Um, Belarus becomes kind of a success story of Soviet modernization, Soviet modernity. Um, this was a largely peasant republic, very little industry before World War II. Um, but during the Masherov decades, it becomes a very powerful, it develops a successful industrial center. Um, it was the time of industrial expansion. The most, the industries that are the fastest growing industries are those that are science intensive, so high tech by Soviet standards of the 1970s. So we're talking about um, electronics, chemical industry, um, uh, machine building, uh, radio engineering, fiber optics, that kind of stuff, computers in it. Uh, in 1970, also Belarus is already producing almost half of all Soviet potassium output, something that it retains in the post-Soviet era in the sense that it's, it was one of the five largest potassium producers in the world until recently. Um, it probably still produces the potassium, just not buys it. 
Um, but it also produces things like penicillin, you know, this, this sort of, um, chemical fiber that that's very important to Soviet industry. 19% of it is produced in Belarus. 80% uh, of all tractors produced in the Soviet Union are made in Belarus. 22% um, of all motorcycles of the, produced in the Soviet Union are there, so and so on. So as the decades progressed, the, the 60s and 70s, the industrial expansion continued. Um, and as I say, Republic, uh, the Republic was producing quite sophisticated high tech um, equipment and things, but also consumer goods, you know, television, col colorful, not colorful, colored television sets. Um, they were not colorful. Um, refrigerators, um, bicycles, not high tech, but, you know, important. Uh, and they were colorful. Um, and, um, and computers. Science is a very important area of investment, and that's for Mascherel personally. You know, remember his background as physics and math teacher, um, but this is him visiting um, uh, uh, um, Belarusian State University, the, the flagship institution in Minsk, and, and they're showing him his various latest machines and, and so on. And he, he uh, the reason I like this photograph is that he's really engaged. He's kind of, you know, into it. He's not just kind of walking bored out of his mind, but he really wants to know what's going on and what's the latest. Um, and that was matched by the investment that the Republican management um, leadership made and uh, the decisions about investment. Um, Belarus was engaged in the 70s and 80s in uh, nuclear research, um, nuclear energy research. And don't forget, it's also a strategically important uh, borderland republic. Um, as I say, with its own nuclear arsenal. Um, Belarusian agriculture was not forgotten. It was also being modernized. And this is a particular point of concern for Masherov, who remains peasant at heart to some extent. But um, Belarus also has a very important role in producing uh, various foodstuffs for the Soviet Union. So it produces potatoes in huge quantities, but also grain, um, you know, um, sort of um, million, more than a million tons of grain was sold by Belarus to the Soviet Union, not sold, but I mean, in 1973. Um, the targets were even higher for the next year. Um, re Belarus receives generous bonuses in return for its contribution um, to the, the to, in food. Um, and it also it gets all kinds of benefits that are not monetary, you know, not monetary bonuses, but additional benefits for its performance um, in economics. For example, um, it was after the very particularly successful year in 1973, an agricultural year, um, and it was recognized for its achievements, fulfillment of the plan and all that. Um, they used this as an opportunity to apply for permission from Moscow to build a metro in Minsk. Uh, Minsk was only the ninth city in the Soviet Union to have a metro. You had to have permission. You had to be of a certain size to be uh, granted. And Minsk was granted this permission. And this is one of the last things that Russia did um, was to oversee the construction of the metro. And by the time my dad and I took a ride on the first metro train, um, he was gone. But it was his achievement. Um, but although the Republic played a major role in agricultural production of the Soviet Union, the majority of the population by the mid 70s lived in cities. So it was also a time of a huge social change when the peasant republic became an urban republic. Um, and reconstruction played a very important role. But in this process, Belarus in many ways exemplified this trend of rural to urban migration that was shared by the Soviet Union as a whole. But in Belarus, it reached special proportions. Um, Minsk, the capital of the Republic, was particularly stunning in terms of change that it affected. Um, remember, it was so destroyed during the war that the government considered seriously um, moving the capital somewhere else and just starting building from scratch because it was perhaps easier than just clearing all the rubbles and starting. Um, but the Belarusian uh, chief of the party then insisted that Minsk was rebuilt and it was rebuilt. But now in the 60s and 70s, it was one of the fastest growing cities in the Soviet Union. One of um, 
the fastest cities among the 35 largest cities in the Soviet Union. Um, during the 1970s, 55,000 residents arrived to stay every year. Um, the capital's ability to absorb this influx of migrants is quite uh, extraordinary, but it was a very nice place by all accounts to live. It was a very attractive place to live, green, spacious, nice housing, um, constant expansion of industry supply, job opportunities. It had an increasingly more and more educated uh, population and it was very attractive. Now, modernization and modernity were the key tropes of the Soviet project, um, kind of its raison d'etre. This is why the Soviet Union existed, right? And so Belarus came to exemplify in Masherov's years all that the Soviet modernity had to offer, all that that was good about the Soviet modernity. Um, and one visiting Moscow journalist reportedly, this isn't a direct source, but uh, reported by someone else, one journalist came from Moscow to give shadow Masherov around the Republic for a day, and at the end of the day, she said, Soviet power exists only in Belarus, which um, was very worrying for people around her. <laughs> oh, God, how do we respond to that? It's a bit subversive. Um, but this was the kind of emotional response to how well everything was. Um, now, the story of Masherov's Belarus isn't as smooth as all that, as I just noted. So, um, Underneath the image of prosperity, loyalty lurked tensions. Um, industrialization and urbanization brought with them marginalization of the Belarusian language. And this was resented by a large share of the national intelligentsia and, and you know, fought to the best of their ability. Um, the trauma of the Second World War, including the extermination of the Jewish community in Belarus, uh, was brushed under the carpet or had to be suppressed. And this is in a republic where hardly a family was untouched. So not an easy task. In addition to being ruled by a repressive political system, which is the experience that Belarus shared with all Soviet republics, uh, Belarus also during this time experienced the irreparable damage to its unique ecological systems, namely in Polesia. It saw its war memory curtailed, manipulated, um, cut, um, and it lost some of its precious cultural heritage. But it was also taught that it existed as a nation. And that's that was the first. Um, it was also taught that it had its own culture, its own language. However, in practice, it was you know, shunned. But in theory, Belarusians had their own language and um, this is this had an interesting effect um, where people didn't speak and still do not speak Belarusian at home. But whenever they are, they're asked what is your native language, they say Belarusian. Um, it also was taught that it had history and a successful economy. Um, so Belarusian identity looked to the past, but it also looked to the present and the future uh, of which it could be proud. And this sense of collective Pride survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this is something that's often either held against Belarus uh, in modern days or is brushed aside. But I think it's quite important. Um, the same Institute of Public Opinion that I mentioned earlier in 2013, they conducted a poll, um, a survey, and they asked everyone, which do achievements do you think Belarusians can be proud of in the 20th century? And the overwhelming majority, and the people could give different several responses, not limited to one. 78% um, of the respondents said Belarusian contribution to the victory in the Second World War. 17%. This is 2013. And um, a third of the respondents named the post war reconstruction and the, how Belarus kind of rose from the, the um, destruction. Whereas the first ever declaration of Belarusian nation for statehood in 1918 uh, by nationalist intellectuals received just 10% of the vote in the same survey. So contemporary Belarus has often been um, accused of being stuck in the Soviet past. And this is often explained, we used to explain the popularity of Lukashenko until recently. Um, and it's true that Lukashenko tapped very effectively into that sense of pride and security and memory 
um, of that recent past. But the recent protests in Belarus, relatively recent, 2020, um, and the ongoing crisis, the repression, um, show that this le legacy also helped galvanize Belarusians um, against the dictator. Um, this role was played by war memory, for example, during the, the protests when it was the protesters who shouted at the Belarusian police, you're fascist, um, and perceived them as, you know, some, some, someone who was like a Nazi occupier rather than part of their own community because of the violence. Um, and these war memories helped people verbalize, voice their outrage at police brutality, um, torture and detention and so on in 2020. Um, a lot of that anger was voiced through um, evoking war memories. And the anti-Lukashenko protests, I think, have revealed that many in today's Belarus uh, see themselves uh, as part of a modern and civilized nation, technically savvy, um, unlike Russians, for example, Belarusians are very much um, uh, have mastered access to alternative means of information uh, through digital technologies. So they're not beholden to state media um, or television. And um, so also as, as a nation with a sense of humor, again, the, the protests have shown that there were a lot of jokes at the expense of the authorities, even in the most difficult situations and, and kind of confrontations with police. Jokes not on the side of the police, of course. Um, and I think this identity of a modern, civilized, um, uh, technologically savvy nation, urban, very kind of urban and urbane almost, that identity has its roots, paradoxically, though it may seem, in the late Soviet period, um, when Belarus became all that within the Soviet context. Um, and the popular myth surrounding Masharov's death is again worth illuminating here. Um, Masharov was killed in a Sorry, this is Minsk in 1989 as a, as, as a illustration of a good place to live. This is a victory square, it's still there. Um, yeah, so Masharov was um, sadly killed in a car crash in 1980. Um, it was an accident, but immediately, as soon as the rumours of his, no, sorry, not rumours, but, but the news of his death um, came through, uh, almost immediately, there were rumours that Moscow was involved. This wasn't an accident. This was a murder, an assassination. Um, and, you know, Masharov's funeral um, attracted so many people in Belarus. This is the funeral procedure um, that they in, in Minsk, sorry, that the um, um, ceremony of um, saying goodbye with the body had to last for longer because people just kept on coming and coming and coming, coming and joining. Um, and uh, and then the authorities, when, when the body was taken to the cemetery, people just lined up um, the streets along the path, um, even though it was raining and some people stood for hours with children just to say goodbye. And this kind of outpouring of, of popular grief is not quite common. I mean, yes, it was staged a lot of times in Soviet um, uh, political so ceremonial culture, but this wasn't staged. This caused some inconvenience to the authorities. Um, and, and it was genuine. And the rumours of Moscow's involvement were there then, and at all, at all kinds of levels, not just that sort of, you know, ordinary people far removed from uh, the corridors of power, but even within those corridors of power, within sort of cultural elites, there were those who thought this wasn't an accident. Um, these rumours persist to this day, um, and there's still, you know, um, TV shows that discuss whether this was a murder or not. There are still those who write books and articles and, and so on. And I think this is quite telling. This is, you know, the, the, the message here is that this, our guy was killed by them. So there is us versus them, um, uh, manifestation of that sort of a different identity and separation. Um, and also um, often Masharov is remembered as someone, and, and this may be wrong, this may not necessarily reflect who, what he thought or how he felt about the relationship between Belarus and Moscow, but he's often seen by Belarusians today as someone who was a true patriot of Belarus, um, a Soviet, a communist, but a patriot of Belarus who defended Belarusian interests against Moscow's imperial grasp. Thank you.
Thank you for your people, yeah. Um, so we have perhaps questions from the floor first, and then there may be some questions at home. Bring up a nice picture. Uh, I'm sure. Oh, yes, I can go back to it. This is a little bit slow. I'm not sure why it's so slow, but yes, I, go ahead. I'll, I'll get there. It caught my eye that the soldier on the far left was actually carrying an American weapon. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Were they like Iraqi soldiers or were they carrying a weapon? Or whatever it's hard to tell. They, they, uh, of course, as I'm, I'm sure you know, lend lease was became a big part of Soviet supplies from um, 1943 onwards. That one, isn't it? I hope it's no, it doesn't. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's got a bit slow. It will come back to. Um, yeah, so it, it, interestingly, my um, my grandfather was involved in that, not not in that, but in um, uh, in the far north of the Soviet Union, where the uh, lend lease supplies were shipped through and or flown in. Uh, my grandfather was uh, a, an engineer at the um, airport, the military airport, where the planes landed and they were taken by Soviet pilots and then taken to the front lines in the east. Um, and um, so, so that becomes a big part of, of the Soviet war effort in 1943. At the same time, the Soviets' own production of ammunition really picks up by 1943 and, and matches and exceeds German production sometime as well. Is that the one you're thinking? You have to keep in mind that the Soviets stole a lot of designs and, and it could be, I'm not an expert on uh, weapons um, and all the weapons, but I do know that this was, uh, you know, the good old days before copyright um, and, and also the Soviets wouldn't care anyway. Uh, but it was often the case that they would take um, weapons that they either picked up from the Germans or maybe that they were shipped from Lendley through Lendley's and they would copy them and imitate the production. Uh, that's what post-war yeah. copied American. Yeah, and, and the, the, the military truck that is just such a familiar picture, such a familiar automobile face <laughs> to anyone who's watched Soviet films about the war, to anyone who's been through the war. Um, that was actually a copy of the German Studebaker, I think, or American Studebaker. Um, no Studebaker, different type. Studebaker is a plane <laughs> um, of of a germ of a, an American um, truck, a Ford truck actually, I think it was. Um, and it it's now seen as kind of very Soviet thing, but it wasn't. So this was a very um, common practice to just take the best and, and copy it. And of course, in the 1930s, this was often give, done with the help of American specialists and engineers who were in the Soviet Union and, and were overseeing all kinds of production engineering designs. So, so yeah, uh, but going back to Michelle, I mean, these, these partisans, I'm looking at their uniforms and I think this is not the first wave of the partisans in the sense that these were not just the guys like Masharov who picked up some German guns uh, and went to the woods on, on their own kind of in, initiative. Um, these would most likely have been the ones that were much later from 1942 onwards shipped into the occupied territories by, by Moscow when, when the partisan movement became a very important sort of, um, part of the armed forces of the Soviet war effort um, because they, they have uniform. <laughs> Look at Masharov, he's wearing a torn sweater. Um, there are legends in his family about this sweater because he always ended up with this sweater whenever they would get some supplies from the Germans that they attacked or so yeah, he would get a nice sweater and then some of his comrades then died and they always felt they needed to bury them in the best clothing which is not very practical but he would go back to his old sweater um, anyway so so there, there is an interesting difference in kind of their appearances and it's not accidental Thank you, Andrea, for a very interesting paper. Uh, and sorry, Paul, I'm, going, I'm sure I'm going to delete from the back. That's fine. <laughs> it's from the French Mont Chéri. Yeah. Well, they say, they, oh, I still it's, Chris, it, it's a legend, <laughs> that, you know, Napoleonic troops. Um, um, so you talked from very quickly on props and what been that rosy. <laughs> and one thing which I have not, sorry for being the bit of uh, 
the negative person here, yeah, but you know, I, I can't see anyone being perfect. And, uh, and it, it feels a bit like he's a kind of hero and uh, this very great symbol that you highlight. Uh, and I think, that, of course, that is fascinating in its own terms. But is there a bit of propaganda or something like that that has created also this kind of uh, mm. um, very positive image of him? I mean, from what you've described, I mean, it must be also. I mean, as I say, I can't think of anyone. It's perfect. Yeah. So, Where's the catch, right? Where's the catch? Yeah, well, the catch yeah. there must this be something is disgustingly wrong with perfect. <laughs> yes, I'm sure there was. Um, I think his post Soviet image to some extent has been colored by those who were his associates, who were very um, themselves committed communists um, and pro-Soviet and who probably thought that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a bad thing um, or, or something that, you know, a, 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 the Soviet Union was something that uh, accorded more respect or demanded more respect and so on. And so in, in remembering how they worked with him, what he was like, I'm sure they embellished the man, um, not least because often he's being presented in writings of those individuals, um, and I do take them with you know, a big grain of salt, um, as, as a true communist. That's what a communist should be like. And yes, there were such people, because look at Masherov, and that's proof that the Soviet Union was not all that bad, and had it been in the hands, you know, had the government always been in the hands of the right people like Masherov, it would have been a much better a more viable political project. Um, so I think there, there is a little bit of that, a lot of that on the part of certain, you know, um, uh, a group of memoir writers and, and public figures. Um, but it's very difficult to find dirt on him. <laughs> and, and it's very difficult to get, he wasn't perfect. Um, he liked to talk a lot. Um, uh, uh, people who say how they felt at ease with him and how you know he was charming and so on. It's always him talking. Um, he also, you know, had a, a very particular vision of how things were to be done, and he often was impatient with people who could brush themselves, was unfair, and so on. So I've come across those moments as well. But then again, if you're in power for 15 years, you can't get through those 15 years without offending someone. Um, there are some. Um, you know, so th there's some arguments about whether he was a patriot or he was just through and through loyal, loyal Moscow's man. Um, all of that sort of uh, thinking of him and defending the interests of the Republic, that's just our wishful thinking. He wasn't any of that. He was uh, a very hard, and, and he was, I think, a very hardened Cold War warrior um, uh, who had no kind of hesitation following the party line. Um, was he as a ruthless person? I don't think so. I mean, personally, he does seem to be a kind of an, an intelligentsia man um, and, and quite modest and humble in many ways. So um, there were a lot of things that were ethical about him. I, I think it's very difficult to get at him in the archives. Um, some Someone who's in charge of the Republic is uh, everywhere, you know, in every document, in every decision, in every policy, there's him. But he's also nowhere because there's nowhere of him as a man, as a person, as a, you know, yes, I get memoirs of his daughter, but I don't often believe her. <laughs> um, the other daughter is completely silent, never gives any interviews or anything. Um, his cook thought he was wonderful and nice and uh, down to earth. And people who met him outside context of work, but, you know, it's kind of. Um, his constituency, they always thought he was good. He was a very cunning political operator. Um, I remember reading a, a memoir of someone who said, oh gosh, I, I came to, he was a low level sort of party functioning. He came to Masharov with a problem that needed sorting b between this small functionary that, and problem at his level and the military in Minsk. And um, sort of, kind of institutional interests clash. And he said, he came to Masharov, he saw me, but um, and, and he uh, asked me all kinds of questions about how things are going in my district. And he was so nice. And then he was really apologetic, but he was late for another meeting. Oh, dear. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? This is so naive. He just, you know, chatted through to you, didn't ask you, didn't tell you, didn't promise you anything, didn't help you. And you were happy about that. <laughs> but the problem was sorted eventually somehow. So my sheriff bought himself some time, um, you know, charmed the guy out of his socks, dismissed him and then sorted the problem in his way on his own. 
Um, so he was, you know, he was not stupid. He was very cunning. He was not just all smiles and, and laughter, but he was also decent. And compared to, you know, the, the Brezhnev um, cohort um, people in Moscow, he was a huge contrast. Um, but, yeah, he's, he's mysterious. For all of his sort of out there, um, he's difficult to get at. Just to comment on the idea of being Prussian presidential because at the same time, the 70s, uh, she's got this uh, French president who did exactly the same thing, yeah. where a German, yeah. and actually that doesn't work at all for the French. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, oh, yeah, you're not inviting yourself at all. How oh, dare you? Yeah. Yeah, all, it's all public opinion. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's exactly the same thing, yeah. but not perceived the same way. No, he's, he's very good at freezing people. Uh, he's very good. And, and, you know, in the sense, it was easy for him because he wasn't pretending. He was one of them. Um, and he got education. Uh, he went up. You know, his case was just the most extreme case of mobility, social mobility, that was replicated by all kinds of people in Belarus. You know, millions of people did the same. They didn't become the first secretary, but they went from the regs to middle class, to educated, university educated. You were first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You said that he turned um, Belarus into this kind of industrial powerhouse, but you did mention that there was like irreparable damage to yeah. the ecology of Belarus. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, the two things don't contradict each other, don't they? I mean, he. Um, I have to be a little bit more nuanced. Not he, but on his watch, uh, with permission, sanction, investment from Moscow. Um, so none, none of this was just of his own making in defiance of the interests of, of the Kremlin. This was part of the, you know. but of course, as every uh, party leader, re Republican or regional party leader within the Russian Republic, um, they competed uh, and negotiated with the Center for Resources. Um, and despite some uh, debates as to his personal relationship with uh, Brezhnev, some say they were fine. Others say Brezhnev had no time for my sheriff, and, and that's why he took four years to come to Minsk to award Minsk this sort of city hero status after World War um, But despite these debates, you know, my sheriff clearly is good at getting things done on some for some issues, um, and economy clearly is one of them. You know, the Belarus receives a lot of investment, um, a lot of economic support. Uh, it gives back certainly. It's an investment that pays off um, for the center, I think. But um, but it, it's Masharov and, you know, in negotiation with Moscow. This often came at a cost, and one of the costs was to this region of Palesia, which is a southwest, west-southwest part of Belarus. Palesia is an ecological, um, a unique, uh, as of a unique space, unique ecological combination of things. It's, it's uh, and, and Belarus shares that with Poland, um, that region. Um, it's um, it's got uh, a, a very uh, different ecological system in the sense that it's basically a swamp, but more <laughs> swamp sounds pretty horrible. But it's a sort of a water system with some swampy areas that creates a particular microclimate in which animals, birds, um, plants that don't really exist anywhere else exist and are able to survive. And the damage was done by the decision that predates Masharov. It wasn't his decision, but under his watch, this process gained a lot of momentum. And that decision was to dry up that swamp, amelioration, as it was called, of the land, to plough them up, to turn them into productive agricultural farming lands. Um, and uh, there were those at the time, the, the scientists, scholars who raised their voice to to say this is this will be a disaster. It's not worth it. Um, you may yes, you may be able to farm these lands, but it, we will lose something far more valuable. And they were brushed aside. Um, there is a, a, a debate about Masharov's. You know, um, he was very much involved, but to what extent he realized. Um, the damage and and some say um, he later regretted it. We will never know. Um, but yeah, but this was the main um, source of criticism. And, and you know, going back to saying that this he wasn't perfect. Um, he let that happen. So he let the economic interests take priority over environmental interests, um, and especially something that was very seen as Belarusian national sort of national heritage. Um, he brushed that aside. Um, similarly, with Belarusian language and culture, 
Um, many accused him of the fact that, you know, and it's true on his watch, prosification in schools, in um, public sphere was just rampant. The Belarus and Ukraine were the only two republics where the use of national language in schools was dropping. Everywhere else it was on the rise and in Belarus it was dropping. And Russia was accused of abetting that, kind of being a bystander, if you like, in that. So there are a lot of criticisms of him in some quarters. Um, not of him as a person, but of his policies, the decision making, the fact that he, you know, but again, he's part of what happens to Belarus at the time. Belarus moves from village to the city. With that comes good quality of life. With that comes, um, you know, new cultural opportunities, um, new educational opportunities. But it's better to speak Russian. Um, and it's very difficult to say whether the people decided that it's better to speak Russian and that, that was that, because they thought, well, all education in universities is in Russian. If I want my children to go to university, my children better go to a Russian-speaking school. Um, the authorities could have done something to change it, to what extent they, they were free, when um, Latvia and Azerbaijan in the 1950s tried to contest Moscow's pressure on Russification, they got purged. The that, that how they keep their autonomy, though? that kind of give and take, they, they keep more autonomy, but they show loyalty. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, you can say, well, Georgians were able to get away with a lot of the kind of language stuff because Russia sees them differently, Moscow sees them differently, whereas Belarus, Slavic people, got to speak Russian. Um, and Masharov, yes, maybe he was, you know, the process started before him. He didn't reverse it. He didn't try to stop it. But he supported um, Belarusian writers, Belarusian literature. Um, more books were published in Belarusian. That they, they were subsidized. They were not selling, but the authorities subsidized them to be produced. They forced bookshops to take them and try to sell them. I mean, when you start digging, there's actually a lot that he's done. Um, there are all kinds of other cultures and cultural, you know, the heritage sector basically didn't exist in Belarus. Under Masharov, it gets investment. It get things get you know brushed up. Uh, the old churches that no one cared about um, uh, suddenly get restoration money and they become, you know, concert venues. They don't become churches, but they become concert venues much better than a, a store, a warehouse. Um, and so, you know, you, you kind of see that give and take absolutely a dynamic with Moscow. My question is about the legacy. Uh, um, you mentioned that he arrived to power with the support of the local elites and that mm -hmm. there was a candidate from Moscow that actually he managed to beat. And I wonder what happened to those elites after he died. Because m my knowledge of Belarus comes from having been a, a reporter at, based in the Council of Europe for many mm -hmm. years. And, and my impression was always that Belarus was really uh, the one that was resisting to leave the Soviet mm -hmm. uh, model. And that, uh, so you talk about this uh, very civilized, sophisticated society that doesn't seem to want to engage at all with the West, that mm -hmm. doesn't like the idea of human rights. And I find that puzzling. So can, can you explain mm -hmm. that mystery to me? <laughs> okay, so the, there, there are two questions, I think, here. One, one is about what happens to Masharov's supporters, um, and, and another is about post-Soviet sort of trajectory of Belarusian society, right? Um, so, on the first question, um, the man he, the Moscow wanted, wasn't from Moscow, but was another local. Um, but the um, sort of informal voting between uh, or, or, or polling—I <laughs> don't know how to describe that, really—asking um, opinion of um, regional secretaries within the republic. So who would you like to see as being first secretary of the party? Uh, yielded a different, yielded the sheriffs coming first and, and Moscow said, OK, for, if, if that's what you want. Now, what happens to them afterwards is a good question because um, to begin with, everything is dandy and Musharraf is in position to promote these people um, to various important posts in the republic. At the same time, the man who was competing with him for the, the position of the first in the party. Um, he's also given a very good position, um, head of the Belarusian government. The head of the, uh, he's the chairman of the Council of Ministers. Um, not quite as powerful as the party chief, but 
also good. So he's not sent to the back of beyond or really, nothing happens. To him. Um, and they work together, you know, seemingly well. After Masharov's death, he becomes um, first secretary eventually. Uh, but even before Masharov is gone, um, Moscow clearly wants to undermine his position within the Republic. And I don't know whether that is replicated in other republics yet or not. Um, possibly it's part of a general Soviet trend at the time. But he, his supporters, the the partisans um, who are, uh, take, who occupy other important posts in the um, political hierarchy in Belarus, they get moved to, to Moscow usually or somewhere else in Russia, but they sort of, they're, they're not, you know, dismissed, they're not attacked, but they are promoted out of Masharov's reach. And instead, someone from Moscow or someone from other parts of the Soviet Union is sent to replace them. So this support base is diluted with time. And by the time Masharov is gone, um, an interesting thing happens because um, despite that, you know, kind of public manifestation of, of um, popular love, I don't know, at the funeral, or however you may want to phrase it, um, all memory of Masharov in the immediate years after his death in the early 80s is removed, erased. Uh, there's no book about him. There's no kind of commemoration. Very few sort of monuments, but no monuments at all. I mean, there are some. Um, I don't know how to explain it. There's big steamboats um, somewhere else in Russia named after him. So it's a steamboat unnamed after Masharov. But in Belarus itself, there's very little commemoration. Um, and um, a, a writer wants to write memoirs about Masharov because he knew him really well. He was himself a you know kind of party functionary, even though he was a writer. And he's told, don't do that. Better not to. Let's leave it for a while. And so he's told, told to kind of forget it. So there's all this kind of silence that surrounds him after his death, which raises questions. Um, but it's only with the, the arrival of the 90s that people start bringing him back up. Now, in terms of the Belarusian society, um, just very quickly, it's um, Belarusians for, for a long time since um, the collapse of the Soviet Union have chosen um, economic stability and social equality over lots of other things. Um, and this was the legacy of the late Soviet period. It was a comfortable time for a lot of people in Belarus. Yes, there were restrictions. Yes, there were some repressions for those who were unhappy about Belarus and language, for example. Um, but even that was fairly mild compared to other republics. Um, and it was a good time to live. Um, and when the 90s happened, the 90s in the Soviet, former Soviet Union were terrible. And for a lot of people, it was a... a and not a future. Um, and in Belarus, people even before the Soviet Union collapsed, they were reluctant to leave. Um, in March of 1991, um, the national referendum, um, the majority voted to, to preserve the Soviet Union. It's only when the Soviet Union effectively kind of disintegrated, Belarusians were going to, OK. Uh, but um, nevertheless, and despite Lukashenko, um, who was there for almost three decades, um, Belarusian civil society began to develop, and in the last few years before the protests, Belarusian civil society was quite vibrant. Um, and it's not quite true that the um, society wasn't interested in human rights, um, but it's just that their understanding of human rights and democracy was a little bit different and coloured by, I think, the Soviet experience where human rights meant that everyone is equal, there are no very rich people, very poor people, uh, we get guaranteed job security, we guarantee work um, and ability to travel and, and, and so on. And, and they had all that under Lukashenko to a point. Um, but that social contract that was modeled on Soviet model was failing in the last several, in the, in the last decade especially. And, uh, uh, and of course, when the protests started and the authorities responded with violence, physical violence, brutality, beatings, and random repression. Um, that really tipped the boat and Belarus and said, we don't want that. that. That's not what you promised us. And and and, and recently with the war in you, and, and that suggests that that sort of appreciation of human dignity, of, of sort of value of some rights being protected was there. And, and it just wasn't touched by the authorities on a mass scale. But once it was disturbed on a mass scale, not just some opposition democratic you know, activists, but a mass um, sort of repression, 
that tip about that. And um, now with the war in Ukraine, um, another very crucial promise that Lukashenko made and, and to Belarus was enormously important ever since 1940. One thing that um, Belarusians have always been saying since the, the war that as long as there's no war, we can take many things as long as there's no war. And Lukashenko came and um, um, sort of built a lot of his legitimacy on that promise. That's how, where the memory of the Second World War that's very much modeled in the Soviet war memory comes from, because that was the signal that we respect that. We respect that legacy. Um, it was also the fact, it was also, you know, um, proclaimed quite explicitly in those very words. The one thing I promise you, we said to the people, that there will be no war. Belarus is not part of the war. So that other major kind of political promise uh, was broken and there's no going back. More questions from the floor? Any question at home? Uh, if there is any question, you can raise the hand or write in the chat. Nothing up here for the moment. I think we probably have... Oh, we have here. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I couldn't see you because of... Yes. Yes, um, so, so education first and, and then the um, ideology. Um, for very you know, obvious, I think, personal reasons, education to him was hugely important. Um, education was something that, you know, he benefited enormously from. As I say, he was one of the first two boys to go to university from his village. Um, and because he kept in touch with his village, the, the sort of prestige, the states, the respect that villagers afforded him, according to his sister's memoirs, was surely something that he, you know, that had an, an impact or impacted him greatly. Um, and then he was a teacher. Um, and um, education in Belarus was, um, uh, you know, received a, a huge boost under, under him. Um, I remember, and, and uh, you know, science and education were always linked because the Soviets viewed education as a means to an end, which is why they uh, put emphasis on technical, scientific, you know, um, natural sciences education. The value decrease, you know. History wasn't one of them. Um, so uh, he also had that very pragmatic outlook on uh, science, on, on education as a, as a way to um, not just rise through social kind of ranks but also but to become useful and to be able to contribute something to the economy and so um education was very much high on his agenda you know the, the list of his priorities um uh, there are so if there's evidence of memoirs of him pushing educational reform that the uh, version of um introduced to the Soviet Union, pushing it further and faster in Belarus because he thought it was, and, and making amendments to it, which caused friction with the center, um, because he felt this is really important and we need to get on with it. We're behind. Kind of, um, and his emphasis was on practical of an education, um, on, on, you know, something that could be useful to the economy. Um, 
I, I don't know if that answers your question, but as a result, the general educational level of the Republic was um, uh, lifted. Uh, Belarus had a lot of people from outside of the Republic who came because Belarus needed specialists. And so this was a very Soviet practice to get to invite from other parts of the Soviet Union people who could contribute to the economy uh, in a particular locality. Also, um, he invested quite a lot into sorry, uh, uh, invested quite a lot into the um, uh, Academy of Sciences and and um, making sure Belarus got a lot of its own PhD graduates and and uh, master graduates. As well. In terms of um, ideology, yes, he was a, a committed. He was a believer, um, but he was again a little bit different. He was, uh, say, from Khrushchev, who was very hands on pragmatical kind of uh, a man on ideology. Um, uh, Masharov knew theory well. He he read a lot. He was a very well read, um, apparently, person. Uh, took a lot of interest, not just in politics, but in arts, in, in theatre, in literature, could cite things, was interested in art, in fine arts, and, and liked to have his own opinion. And he didn't like to be accompanied by ideologists who whispered into his ear he wanted to be left alone and tour the, the picture halls without anyone, unlike Khrushchev. Um, but he was also quite strong on ideology and, and kind of the political side of things. He could theorize. Of course, his theories, you know, fell into line more or less, but he uh, produced speeches and he produced um, writings and interviews with Pravda, with the uh, communist journal, which was the, the, the main a theoretical journal of the Communist Party. Um, that would, you know, he wasn't inventing things because you couldn't do that. I mean, maybe maybe Brezhnev could do that, but that wasn't your place as, as the first secretary of the Republican mm -hmm. Party to invent things. But he certainly could develop or elaborate or interpret things that were accepted as, as a doctrine or part of the doctrine at the time. Um, and he was, very, you know, he was very eloquent with that. Um, but to say that he was uh, subversive to the system would be wrong. Uh, he was very much committed, very loyal. He believed in communism, and why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't he? It's given him so much. Um, how he processed the fact that his father had been arrested, I think that that's something we will probably never know because um, um, I, I have some memoirs about how he. Um, showed respect to Stalin, but also acknowledged that there were problems during the 1930s. This is much later. I don't know how much I can trust that source. Um, it, it's um, it's true that in the 50s, he sought, he and his brother sought to find out what happened with their father. The, their father was rehabilitated, but they never found out the details, or at least that's nowhere in the sources, and no members of the family will tell you that they know anything. But um, I think the family kind of take on this, and I think it came from Masharov, and this is speculation, of course, that um, their, their father was arrested because of a denunciation letter. It wasn't the fault of, you know, Stalin, crudely put. Um, those were difficult times. Yes, a lot of innocent people were taken, but it was the, the blame seemed to, in the kind of family discourse, the blame seemed to be put on whoever wrote that denunciation letter rather than questioning the system that allowed for that possibility of someone, you know, dispatching a person by writing an enunciation. Um, and I think also a, a huge impact on him in terms as a believer and a, as someone who was committed to the Soviet system of the war um, and seeing what he saw um, and his life experience confirmed for him that the Soviet system was it. Okay, wow, we we have exceeded our time slot. This is the TC four, so that has been fabulous, really. I, I learned enormously. Thank and, you. It has been fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your question. That, uh, we are meeting again on the 11th of May. We have a talk of Dr. James Gregory from the University of Plymouth on the history of mercy, uh, mercy in uh, Anglo American. Uh, Perspective. So, or lack of. Or lack of. <laughs> or lack of. Yes. 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 So, see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye much. at home, too. Bye bye.
Yeah, I like that. I like that.